Section 27 of The Wisdom of the Ancients. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The Wisdom of the Ancients A Series of Mythological Fables by Francis Bacon. Section 27 Prometheus, or the State of Man, Explained of an Overruling Providence and of Human Nature. The ancients relate that man was the work of Prometheus and formed of clay. Only the artificer mixed in with the mass, particles taken from different animals. And being desirous to improve his workmanship and endow, as well as create, the human race, he stole up to heaven with a bundle of birch rods, and kindling them at the chariot of the sun, thence brought down fire to the earth for the service of men. They add that, for this meritorious act, Prometheus was repaid with ingratitude by mankind, so that, forming a conspiracy, they arraigned both him and his invention before Jupiter. But the matter was otherwise received than they imagined, for the accusation proved extremely grateful to Jupiter and the gods, insomuch that, delighted with the action, they not only indulged mankind the use of fire, but, moreover, conferred upon them a most acceptable and desirable present, viz. perpetual youth. But men, foolishly overjoyed hereat, laid this present of the gods upon an ass, who, in returning back with it, being extremely thirsty, strayed to a fountain. The serpent, who was guardian thereof, would not suffer him to drink, but upon condition of receiving the burden he carried, whatever it should be. The silly ass complied, and thus the perpetual renewal of youth was for a drop of water, transferred from men to the race of serpents. Prometheus, not desisting from his unwarrantable practices, though now reconciled to mankind, after they were thus tricked of their present, but still continuing inveterate against Jupiter, had the boldness to attempt deceit, even in a sacrifice, and is said to have once offered up two bulls to Jupiter, but so as in the hide of one of them to wrap all the flesh and fat of both, and stuffing out the other hide only with the bones. Then, in a religious and devout manner, gave Jupiter his choice of the two. Jupiter, detesting this sly fraud and hypocrisy, but having thus an opportunity of punishing the offender, purposely chose the mock bull. And now, giving way to revenge, but finding he could not chastise the insolence of Prometheus without afflicting the human race, in the production whereof Prometheus had strangely and insufferably prided himself, he commanded Vulcan to form a beautiful and graceful woman, to whom every god presented a certain gift, whence she was called Pandora. They put into her hands an elegant box, containing all sorts of miseries and misfortunes, but hope was placed at the bottom of it. With this box she first goes to Prometheus to try if she could prevail upon him to receive and open it. But he, being upon his guard, warily refused the offer. Upon this refusal she comes to his brother, Epimetheus, a man of a very different temper, who rashly and inconsiderately opens the box when finding all kinds of miseries and misfortunes issued out of it, he grew wise too late, and with great hurry and struggle endeavored to clap the cover on again, but with all his endeavor could scarce keep in hope which lay at the bottom. Lastly, Jupiter arraigned Prometheus of many heinous crimes, as that he formerly stole fire from heaven, that he contemptuously and deceitfully mocked him by a sacrifice of bones that he despised his present, adding withal a new crime, that he attempted to ravish Pallas. For all which he was sentenced to be bound in chains, 
and doomed to perpetual torments. Accordingly, by Jupiter's command, he was brought to Mount Caucasus, and there fastened to a pillar, so firmly that he could no way stir. A vulture, or eagle, stood by him, which, in the daytime, gnawed and consumed his liver, but in the night the wasted parts were supplied again, whence matter for his pain was never wanting. They relate, however, that his punishment had an end, for Hercules, sailing the ocean in a cup or pitcher, presented him by the sun, came at length to Caucasus, shot the eagle with his arrows, and set Prometheus free. In certain nations, also, there were instituted particular games of the torch, to the honor of Prometheus, in which they who ran for the prize carried lighted torches, and as any one of these torches happened to go out, the bearer withdrew himself, and gave way to the next, and that person was allowed to win the prize, who first brought in his lighted torch to the goal. Explanation this fable contains and enforces many just and serious considerations, some whereof have been long since well observed, but some again remain perfectly untouched. Prometheus clearly and expressly signifies providence. For of all the things in nature, the formation and endowment of man was singled out by the ancients, and esteemed the peculiar work of providence. The reason hereof seems, one, that the nature of man includes a mind and an understanding, which is the seat of providence. Two, that it is harsh and incredible to suppose reason and mind should be raised and drawn out of senseless and irrational principles, whence it becomes almost inevitable that providence is implanted in the human mind in conformity with, and by the direction and the design of, the greater overruling providence. But, three, the principal cause is this, that man seems to be the thing in which the whole world centers, with respect to final causes, so that if he were away, all other things would stray and fluctuate, without end or intention, or become perfectly disjointed and out of frame. For all things are made subservient to man, and he receives use and benefit from them all. Thus the revolutions, places, and periods of the celestial bodies serve him for distinguishing times and seasons, and for dividing the world into different regions. The meteors afford him prognostications of the weather. The winds sail our ships, drive our mills, and move our machines. And the vegetables and animals of all kinds either afford us matter for houses and habitations, clothing, food, physic, or tend to ease or delight, to support or refresh us, so that everything in nature seems not made for itself, but for man. And it is not without reason added, that the mass of matter whereof man was formed, should be mixed up with particles taken from different animals, and wrought in with the clay, because it is certain, that of all things in the universe, man is the most compounded and recompounded body so that the ancients, not improperly, styled him a microcosm, or little world within himself. For although the chemists have absurdly and too literally wrested and perverted the elegance of the term microcosm, whilst they pretend to find all kind of mineral and vegetable matters, or something corresponding to them, in man, yet it remains firm and unshaken that the human body is, of all substances, the most mixed and organical, whence it has surprising powers and faculties. For the powers of simple bodies are but few, though certain and quick, as being little broken or weakened and not counterbalanced by mixture. But excellence and quantity of energy reside in mixture and composition. Man, however, in his first origin, seems to be a defenseless, naked creature, slow in assisting himself, and standing in need of numerous things. Prometheus, therefore, hastened to the invention of fire, which supplies and administers to nearly all human uses and necessities, 
insomuch that, if the soul may be called the form of forms, if the hand may be called the instrument of instruments, fire may, as properly, be called the assistant of assistants, or the helper of helps. For hence proceed numberless operations, hence all the mechanic arts, and hence infinite assistances are afforded to the sciences themselves. The manner wherein Prometheus stole this fire is properly described from the nature of the thing, he being said to have done it by applying a rod of birch to the chariot of the sun. For birch is used in striking and beating, which clearly denotes the generation of fire to be from the violent percussions and collisions of bodies, whereby the matters struck are subtilized, rarefied, put into motion, and so prepared to receive the heat of the celestial bodies, whence they, in a clandestine and secret manner, collect and snatch fire, as it were by stealth, from the chariot of the sun. The next is a remarkable part of the fable, which represents that men, instead of gratitude and thanks, fell into indignation and expostulation, accusing both Prometheus and his fire to Jupiter. And yet the accusation proved highly pleasing to Jupiter, so that he, for this reason, crowned these benefits of mankind with a new bounty. Here it may seem strange that the sin of ingratitude to a creator and benefactor, a sin so heinous as to include almost all others, should meet with approbation and reward. But the allegory has another view, and denotes that the accusation and arraignment, both of human nature and human art among mankind, proceeds from a most noble and laudable temper of the mind, and tends to a very good purpose, whereas the contrary temper is odious to the gods, and unbeneficial in itself. For they who break into extravagant praises of human nature, and the arts in vogue, and who lay themselves out in admiring the things they already possess, and will needs have the sciences cultivated among them, to be thought absolutely perfect and complete, in the first place, show little regard to the divine nature, whilst they extol their own inventions almost as high as his perfection. In the next place, men of this temper are unserviceable and prejudicial in life, whilst they imagine themselves already got to the top of things, and there rest without further inquiry. On the contrary, they who arraign and accuse both nature and art, and are always full of complaints against them, not only preserve a more just and modest sense of mind, but are also perpetually stirred up to fresh industry and new discoveries. Is not, then, the ignorance and fatality of mankind to be extremely pitied, whilst they remain slaves to the arrogance of a few of their own fellows? and are dotingly fond of that scrap of Grecian knowledge, the peripatetic philosophy, and this to such a degree as not only to think all accusation or arraignment thereof useless, but even hold it suspect and dangerous? Certainly the procedure of Empedocles, though furious, but especially that of Democritus, who with great modesty complained that all things were abstruse, that we know nothing, that truth lies hid in deep pits, that falsehood is strangely joined and twisted along with the truth, is to be preferred before the confident, assuming, and dogmatical school of Aristotle. Mankind are, therefore, to be admonished, that the arraignment of nature and of art is pleasing to the gods, and that a sharp and vehement accusation of Prometheus, though a creator, a founder, and a master, obtained new blessings and presents from the divine bounty, and proved more sound and serviceable than a diffusive harangue of praise and gratulation. And let men be assured that the fond opinion that they have already acquired enough is a principal reason why they have acquired so little. That the perpetual flower of youth should be the present which mankind received as a reward for their accusation carries this moral, that the ancients seem not to have despaired of discovering methods and remedies for retarding old age, 
and prolonging the period of human life, but rather reckoned it among those things which, through sloth and want of diligent inquiry, perish and come to nothing, after having been once undertaken, than among such as are absolutely impossible, or placed beyond the reach of the human power. For they signify and intimate, from the true use of fire, and the just and strenuous accusation and conviction of the errors of art, that the divine bounty is not wanting to men in such kind of presence, but that men indeed are wanting to themselves, and lay such an inestimable gift upon the back of a slow-paced ass, that is, upon the back of the heavy, dull, lingering thing, experience, from whose sluggish and tortoise pace proceeds that ancient complaint of the shortness of life and the slow advancement of arts. And certainly it may well seem that the two faculties of reasoning and experience are not hitherto properly joined and coupled together, but to be still new gifts of the gods, separately laid, the one upon the back of a light bird, or abstract philosophy, and the other upon an ass, or slow-paced practice and trial. And yet good hopes might be conceived of this ass, if it were not for his thirst and the accidents of the way. For we judge that if any one would constantly proceed, by a certain law and method, in the road of experience, and not, by the way, thirst after such experiments as make for profit or ostentation, nor exchange his burden, or quit the original design for the sake of these, he might be a useful bearer of a new and accumulated divine bounty to mankind. That this gift of perpetual youth should pass from men to serpents seems added by way of ornament and illustration to the fable, perhaps intimating, at the same time, the shame it is for men that they, with their fire and numerous arts, cannot procure to themselves those things which nature has bestowed upon many other creatures. The sudden reconciliation of Prometheus to mankind, after being disappointed of their hopes, contains a prudent and useful admonition. It points out the levity and temerity of men in new experiments, when, not presently succeeding, or answering to expectation, they precipitately quit their new undertakings, hurry back to their old ones, and grow reconciled thereto. After the fable has described the state of man, with regard to arts and intellectual matters, it passes on to religion, for after the inventing and settling of arts, follows the establishment of divine worship, which hypocrisy presently enters into and corrupts, so that by the two sacrifices, we have elegantly painted the person of a man truly religious and of a hypocrite. One of these sacrifices contained the fat, or the portion of God, used for burning and incensing, thereby denoting affection and zeal, offered up to his glory. It likewise contained the bowels, which are expressive of charity, along with the good and useful flesh but the other contained nothing more than dry bones, which nevertheless stuffed out the hide so as to make it resemble a fair, beautiful, and magnificent sacrifice, hereby finally denoting the external and empty rites and barren ceremonies, wherewith men burden and stuff out the divine worship, things rather intended for show and ostentation than conducing to piety nor are mankind simply content with this mock worship of God, but also impose and further it upon him, as if he had chosen and ordained it. Certainly the prophet, in the person of God, has a fine expostulation as to this matter of choice. Is this the fasting which I have chosen, that a man should afflict his soul for a day, and bow down his head like a bulrush? After touching the state of religion, the fable next turns to manners and the conditions of human life. And though it be a very common, yet is it a just interpretation that Pandora denotes the pleasures and licentiousness 
which the cultivation and luxury of the arts of civil life introduce, as it were, by the instrumental efficiency of fire, whence the works of the voluptuary arts are properly attributed to Vulcan, the god of fire, and hence infinite miseries and calamities have proceeded to the minds, the bodies, and the fortunes of men, together with a late repentance, and this not in each man's particular, but also in kingdoms and states. For wars and tumults and tyrannies have all arisen from this same fountain, or box of Pandora. It is worth observing how beautifully and elegantly the fable has drawn two reigning characters in human life, and given two examples, or tablatures of them, under the persons of Prometheus and Epimetheus. The followers of Epimetheus are improvident, see not far before them, and prefer such things as are agreeable for the present, whence they are oppressed with numerous straits, difficulties, and calamities, with which they almost continually struggle, but in the meantime gratify their own temper, and, for want of a better knowledge of things, feed their minds with many vain hopes, and, as with so many pleasing dreams, delight themselves and sweeten the miseries of life. But the followers of Prometheus are the prudent, wary men that look into futurity and cautiously guard against, prevent, and undermine many calamities and misfortunes. But this watchful, provident temper is attended with a deprivation of numerous pleasures and the loss of various delights, whilst such men debar themselves the use even of innocent things, and what is still worse, rack and torture themselves with cares, fears, and disquiets, being bound fast to their pillar of necessity, and tormented with numberless thoughts, which for their swiftness are well compared to an eagle, that continually wound, tear, and gnaw their liver or mind, unless perhaps they find some small remission by intervals, or as it were, at nights. But then new anxieties, dreads, and fears, soon return again, as it were, in the morning. And therefore very few men, of either temper, have secured to themselves the advantages of providence, and kept clear of disquiets, troubles, and misfortunes. Nor indeed can any man obtain this end without the assistance of Hercules, that is, of such fortitude and constancy of mind as stands prepared against every event, and remains indifferent to every change, looking forward without being daunted, enjoying the good without disdain, and enduring the bad without impatience. And it must be observed that even Prometheus had not the power to free himself, but owed his deliverance to another, for no natural inbred force and fortitude could prove equal to such a task. The power of releasing him came from the utmost confines of the ocean, and from the sun, that is, from Apollo, or knowledge, and again, from a due consideration of the uncertainty, instability, and fluctuating state of human life, which is aptly represented by sailing the ocean, Accordingly, Virgil has prudently joined these two together, accounting him happy who knows the causes of things, and has conquered all his fears, apprehensions, and superstitions. It is added, with great elegance, for supporting and confirming the human mind, that the great hero who thus delivered him sailed the ocean in a cup or pitcher, to prevent fear or complaint, as if through the narrowness of our nature, or a too great fragility thereof, we were absolutely incapable of that fortitude and constancy to which Seneca finally alludes when he says, quote, It is a noble thing at once to participate in the frailty of man and the security of a god. Unquote. We have hitherto, that we might not break the connection of things, designedly omitted the last crime of Prometheus, that of attempting the chastity of Minerva, which heinous offense it doubtless was, that caused the punishment of having his liver gnawed by the vulture. 
the meaning seems to be this, that when men are puffed up with arts and knowledge, they often try to subdue even the divine wisdom and bring it under the dominion of sense and reason, whence inevitably follows a perpetual and restless rending and tearing of the mind. A sober and humble distinction must, therefore, be made betwixt divine and human things, and betwixt the oracles of sense and faith. Unless mankind had rather choose a heretical religion and a fictitious and romantic philosophy. The last particular in the fable is the games of the torch, instituted to Prometheus, which again relates to arts and sciences, as well as the invention of fire, for the commemoration and celebration whereof these games were held. And here we have an extremely prudent admonition, directing us to expect the perfection of the sciences from succession, and not from the swiftness and abilities of any single person. For he who is fleetest and strongest in the course may perhaps be less fit to keep the torch alight, since there is danger of its going out from too rapid as well as from too slow a motion. But this kind of contest with the torch seems to have been long dropped and neglected, the sciences appearing to have flourished principally in their first authors, as Aristotle, Galen, Euclid, Ptolemy, etc., whilst their successors have done very little, or scarce made any attempts. But it were highly to be wished that these games might be renewed to the honor of Prometheus, or human nature, and that they might excite contest, emulation, and laudable endeavors, and the design meet with such success as not to hang tottering, tremulous, and hazarded upon the torch of any single person. Mankind, therefore, should be admonished to rouse themselves and try and exert their own strength and chance and not place all their dependence upon a few men whose abilities and capacities perhaps are not greater than their own. These are the particulars which appear to us shadowed out by this trite and vulgar fable, though without denying that there may be contained in it several intimations that have a surprising correspondence with the Christian mysteries, in particular the voyage of Hercules, made in a pitcher, to release Prometheus, bears an allusion to the word of God, coming in the frail vessel of the flesh to redeem mankind. But we indulge ourselves no such liberties as these, for fear of using strange fire at the altar of the Lord. End of section 27. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois.